Hi, welcome back. I'm here with Leonora Reese. I didn't, is that the proper pronunciation? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, we're, we're getting towards the end of the day here in the U.S. It's morning there in, uh, you're in the Melbourne area, correct? I'm currently yeah. in Queensland, but usually in Melbourne, yes, in okay. Australia, yes. Got it. And uh, we've had quite a few economists on today, uh, and it's somewhat unsurprising given the topic that we're addressing. So if you would introduce yourself uh, a bit and what you're doing there at uh, RMIT and what that stands for, I know, but I'm gonna let you reveal. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Sure, thank you, Al. Thanks so much to the organizers for this opportunity to connect with this great community and to share what I can to the conversation. Um, as Al has mentioned, I'm afraid to say I am another economist <laughs> joining this conversation. Um, I'm currently a lecturer and academic economist at RMIT, which is the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology University in Melbourne. Uh, previously, I was a research fellow at the Women and Public Policy Program at the Harvard Kennedy School and had the great fortune to work uh, with Iris Bonnet there. Um, oh. And yeah, and I'm also the chair of the Women in Economics Network in Australia. So economics as a discipline uh, is a traditionally male dominated profession in itself. So in so far as we're trying to research and offer policy advice to the rest of society to become more gender equitable and diverse across many different demographic factors, we have to internally work on that ourselves as a profession. So, so much of my research overlaps with my own profession and my own workplace. Wow, well, now I'm even more excited. I was excited before, now even more. So I'll let you have at it, then I'll come back at the end, we'll have a little chat. Does that sound good? Thank you so much, wonderful. All right, enjoy. So thank you again for this opportunity to contribute. What I can contribute to this uh, conversation is an economist's perspective on interrogating the evidence. And I really enjoyed the previous uh, presentation. I think this uh, can follow through quite nicely on, on what um, the presenters had to offer there. Really, what we're interested in is uh, navigating the, the suite, the array of gender diversity and gender equality initiatives that we have available to us. We've made progress in recognising the gains of gender diversity and gender equality. Uh, we do have the potential to put in place these interventions and these policies, but we need to know what works and we need to be really honest about what doesn't work. Uh, which interventions uh, don't work, that's just as important because then we know what to channel our resources away from and to redirect them into the things that do work. As the previous presenters also said, econ economics has so much to learn from other disciplines, from sociology, from organisational psychology. And if we can overlap and synergise all those insights together, um, we will really dig deep into understanding why things work or why they don't work and understanding what gets in the way of progress. So in my presentation today, I'm going to share with you some of the research that I've undertaken, uh, which really interrogates the advice that's often given to women to step in and be more confident and assertive in the workplace. I wanna really see, does that work or not? And I also want to contribute a framework for understanding where do all these different policies fit in in the bigger picture? So I'm going to share with you a potential way to, to navigate that. I would like, also like to start by saying that my research here, I'm going to be focusing on gender. Of course, there are so many other dimensions of equality, diversity and belonging that matter. And also we, when we even look at gender, we know that uh, a lot of the data is, is defined definition and there are so many individuals who identify uh, beyond that um, very narrow definition. So I'm basing uh, my research based on the data that we have available, but I would love, definitely want to acknowledge um, what isn't uh, within the scope of what I'm sharing with you today. Now I'm going to move to the next screen. So I would just want to confirm that you can see that, hope so. Um, now in Australia, we have a, a, a practice we are extremely proud of proud of, thank you for that, uh, in that we, uh, we make it customary to acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which we happen to be uh, living and working. And I'm normally based in Melbourne at RMIT University and we're really proud to acknowledge that um, the university is situated 
on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. And on the screen there, you can actually see some um, beautiful artwork, which was um, designed by one of our Indigenous university students. And you'll see a little uh, segment of that artwork throughout the rest of my slides. Where I'm based currently uh, in Queensland, I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Ugamba people. This is a convention we're very proud uh, to, to carry out in Australia. And I hope it's something that, that other countries uh, might consider adopting as well. And now it's just, set the scene of what I'm going to share with you today. This isn't news to anybody here. We know that we've come a long way in terms of gender equality so far in that we have an increasing awareness about gender gaps and workforce outcomes, pay, promotion, uh, leadership representation, uh, gender segregation in certain industries. We now are seeing more and more policies and, and initiatives that are attempting to close that gap, including many of the initiatives that are being shared throughout this conference. But there's no denying the fact that these gaps persist. And at the same time that we might think we have well-intentioned, successful, effective interventions and, and policies in mind, we are also encountering resistance, scepticism, pushback, whether overtly or whether subtly. I'm sure many of us can point to examples of underhanded comments or a lack of support that's really sabotaged our efforts. And I think at the same time that we invest in research and understanding what does work, we also need to have our radar up to deeply understand what are these roadblocks? What are the, where does this pushback come from? Because unless we do, we're not going to make up ground. So I think some overarching questions that we really need to um, understand in an objective, factual, evidence-based way is what causes the gap in the first place? And I've designed this question really because there are so many initiatives that are well-intentioned that come out of observing what we think is happening in terms of workforce dynamics, coming up with an idea, but perhaps it's not really getting to the heart of what generates that differential in the first place. We need to understand what does work and what doesn't work, as I mentioned before, that honesty, that transparency. We need for organisations and researchers to be unafraid to say, we tried this and it didn't work. That can be even more important than understand what, understanding what does work. And as I mentioned, we need to understand where that resistance comes from. So what I've got on the next screen here is a potential sort of roadmap to understand um, all these different gender equality and diversity policies that are available to us at the moment, equal pay legislation, quotas, pay gap audits, interventions, nudges, where do they all sit? Like, how do we place them all alongside? And what I'd like to share with you is a potential way to look at it in terms of a sequential evolutionary process. So if we think back, what, where we have made a lot of gains, not completely, but in, a, in many ways, we have made progress in eradicating a lot of the overt barriers. So now we have it in law that you aren't allowed to pay a female less than a male. Or when a female becomes pregnant, she is allowed to retain her job and won't get fired. Now that's actually progress, considering we know there are decades, centuries, where that wasn't the case. And so what it's left us with is in the minds of many people, um, and this, uh, this messaging throughout society that girls can do anything, um, that it's merit-based, you work hard, you can achieve anything. So that's a starting point. What we have then also seen is a flourishing of interventions that really are targeted at women attempting to help them to catch up sorry, that should say catch up to men, awful typo there, <laughs> to catch, well, imagine as a man speaking, to catch up to me. So catch up to men. And what we're talking about there are policies that take into account women's biological role of maternity leave. Not, notice that's not parental leave, that's maternity leave. Uh, policies to equip women with the skills, the attributes, the personality traits that, uh, that characterise successful men. And this broader awareness about the existence of biases and attempting to train people to be aware of their biases and through that training uh, be cleansed of these biases. So I would categorise that sort of bundle of policies as being very well intentioned but 
are we witnessing uh, are we witnessing true progress in the sense that is it getting rid of these biases that exist in the first place? What I would argue is that we still have gender gaps, we still have implicit biases, we still have gender norms, and I'm sure many people here can um, identify with this um, dichotomy between a man and a female, uh, sorry, a male and a female in, in the workplace exhibiting the same behaviour. One is called a boss, one is called bossy, um, and this um, continuation of very gender patterned uh, toys and activities um, right from a junior age. So really we haven't made progress in terms of really is it an even playing field? We think there is, but in practice we know there are still many things that cause gender segregation. Again, I'm sure many people, are, are, this is not new to you, but this is a way of sort of putting it all together. So that really brings us to this third and final stage, which um, reflects uh, what the previous speakers talking about their SODI uh, interventions and behavioural nudges was really about. And that's where instead of attempting to uh, change women to act more like men to fit into a bias system, how about we dismantle and cleanse those biases from the system to begin with? And what I've got on the screen there are some examples. You might be familiar with this um, blind audition experiment that was conducted by, I believe it was the Boston Symphony Orchestra, where you would have assumed that they would have chosen the best musician for the job. And uh, they conducted an experiment where they brought in a blind audition, so literally a curtain that would conceal the gender of the musician who was auditioning. And lo and behold, they did observe that women's representation within the orchestra uh, increased over time. So I use that example because it's really vivid, it's really, it makes you think, wow, surely a symphony orchestra wouldn't be biased. Um, but indeed, as much as they believe that they weren't, they were proven uh, to be so. We want to talk about unpacking or um, dismantling uh, gender stereotypes and gender norms so that, um, that men who want to uh, fulfil a um, family life don't suffer repercussions for that in the same way that uh, women don't suffer implicit repercussions or biases or barriers when they enter uh, traditionally male uh, domains. And um, increasingly we hear about this concept called gender lensing and economics. Uh, we call it gender responsive budgeting or gender responsive design, gender impact analysis, where any plan or proposal um, goes through a filter of being critiqued for what is the impact on women, what is the impact on um, men and even though something might seem to be gender neutral to begin with it's shown to have actually gender patterned um, either advantages or disadvantages so that's an example of that sort of that third package of, of policies um, and initiatives that really tries to cleanse the biases from the system rather than trying to attempt women to play along with a, a biased system Okay, so if I sum it up, it, it, we could think of it as three stages here. Um, erasing overt discrimination, so yes, girls can do anything. Let's try to help women catch up to men, but what that's doing is actually targeting deficiencies at a personal, personal level. Um, that third stage would be that we target the implicit biases, we re redesign the practices rather than attempt to change people. Really difficult to de-bias and change people but it is possible to change uh, practices which we have uh, created. So what I'd like to um, share with you now is an example of how some of these policies um, should be interrogated before we roll them out. And what I'm thinking about here is that sort of middle stage of policies where um, many women probably have received this advice. I know I have. And it's really well-meaning advice. I would like to highlight the fact that I don't think this um, advice comes from a, a sinister place. It comes from a, a place of women who have succeeded. So this advice to lean in, such as Sheryl Sandberg's um, book by that name, um, the advice that women are too nice in the office, you know, you need to be more assertive, you need to be more ballsy, <laughs> you need to act more like a man. There are rows and rows of, sh uh, of shelves in, in bookstores and, you know, in the self-help section uh, which focuses on this. There are industries focused on this. Many of us have probably um, been part of that. Again, it comes from a good place, but is it working? And what I would suggest that as an economist, we would analyse this and think that 
actually what we're getting here is a is a biased selection of people who have succeeded this has worked for them but if it hasn't worked for you you don't go out and write a book about it right so it's what we call sampling on the dependent variable so the people who are successful can tell their story the people for whom this hasn't succeeded they get left out of the picture so we get an unbiased representation of the actual effectiveness of this type of policy and so um, really as an economist, as a labour economist, as a, as a female in the workforce who's received this advice, I thought, you know, well, we, need to, we need to figure out, does this um, policy work? Does this intervention work? Um, because there are potential risks and, and repercussions that it doesn't work. And if we are focusing all our energy towards uh, trying to change women, that's what we're not doing is focusing our energy and efforts towards changing the system instead. So there's a there's a trade-off in uh, our allocation of resources. So really the question is, does this deliver the payoffs? This, does this advice deliver the payoffs it promises? Could there be inadvertent harm? And is it actually getting to the heart of the factors that cause the gender gap in the first place? Um, and so I thought, well, is there a way that we can figure this out? Now, there might be other studies around the world that have kind of tested these types of interventions, like in randomised control trials. Um, I hadn't come across any to my to my knowledge that were kind of really pinpointing on this particular um, scenario. But what I did have at my disposal is this set of data. Um, it's a survey of Australians. Uh, it's a longitudinal survey. We follow the same people over time. In America, you might be uh, familiar with the PSID. Um, it's it's similar to that. And so it's a representative sample across all, all types of industries, all types of demographics. And in the survey, they have on uh, different waves of the survey, different years, they've included uh, questions from psychology. So people here would be familiar with the big five, locus of control, other types of uh, psychological uh, indicators of personality and behavior. Um, so the HILDA survey does include um, a package or inventory of those questions in certain ways. And so in one of the years, this um, psychological variable was included. It's called achievement motivation. And if you read through the questions that respondents are being asked, you get a sense that really what it's asking you is, are you confident to put yourself forward for a challenging situation where you might actually fail? And that very much mirrors this lean-in advice. So go for it. Don't hold yourself back because of fear of failing. Just put yourself forward. Um, you know, don't, don't be deterred by potential repercussions. And so what I did in the data is I looked at people's responses, so how they would... Um, assess themselves according to this uh, personality trait or this personality disposition. And I looked at how it mapped to their workforce outcomes in the following year and holding constant a whole bunch of other variables that could also affect their workforce outcomes. So what I'm going to share with you now is some of the findings where I was studying their likelihood of job promotion uh, in the following year. Uh, using uh, economic uh, analysis, econometric analysis, I did indeed detect that there was a positive correlation between your sense of your confidence, that achievement motivation measure, particularly the hope for success one, and whether or not you got a job promotion in the following year. But there's a big but here. It was only amongst the men. So with men, you saw that positive correlation, with women, no such correlation existed. So visibly, this is how we'd share it on uh, in a graphical way. Um, we're looking at the left-hand side of the screen here, this dimension of achievement motivation called hope for success. There's also fear of failure, but we're gonna focus on this one where we did see that result. The If you look at the blue line representing men, you'll see an onward, upward um, linear slope. So as a hope, the person's hope for success increases, so these are the people, the men with the highest level of confidence, we did see that they had a higher probability of a job promotion in the following year from an average of about 8%, 8% of the workforce on average report getting promoted um, to almost double that, so 14%, holding constant all the other things such as the industry they work in, uh, the education, um, the, the, their location, their occupation. Um, now, if you look at women, the red line, what you can see is it flat lines. So regardless of being 
highly confident, so up this end of the graph, these are the highly confident women, it doesn't correspond to um, a higher rate of job promotion. So there's no, there's no measure of that. It, there's nothing here that would be consistent with the advice that being more confident actually converts into a higher rate of promotion um, according to this particular data. So really what we're talking about there is that big gap. And it was statistically significant when we do the, you know, the complex uh, analysis of it. Now to go beyond that, also in the Hilda survey, there were other, pos uh, other personality traits, the big five locus of control. And to my surprise, actually, what I, I thought, let's throw them in and see if there's a positive correlation there. Again, there was in terms of being more extroverted, more open to experience and having a higher uh, internal locus of control, that was positively correlated with your likelihood of uh, experiencing a job promotion. But again, only amongst men in the sample. When I disaggregated that according to different segments of the workforce, it was that, that um, correlation was strongest in what is traditionally male dominated segments. So trade, for instance, the trades and male dominated industries like um, mining. And beyond that, I thought, well, let's slice this up into different occupations. Is this effect more prominent amongst senior occupations or, or uh, other, other parts of the occupational tier? What I found at that point was that um, that other dimension of achievement motivation called fear of failure. So to what extent um, do you sort of, uh, are you held back um, because of a fear of, 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 of failing? We know there's a negative correlation there between fear of failure and chance of promotion, but men are being penalised more than the women um, amongst managers. In, in other words, uh, managers are not expecting expected to show fear of failure, but even more so if you're a man. So that speaks to that gender norm of men uh, not being permitted, socially permitted, to show weakness or a fear of an apprehension of, of failing. You need to be strong and successful. What the other results really speak to is that there is a template of who a successful worker is. Uh, that for whatever reason, work, uh, organisations are rewarding extra, being extroverted, being confident, being assertive, taking on a challenge, but only amongst men. So that template is is defined in male terms. Um, and so the takeaway implication there uh, intuitively is that that advice to women to be more confident, be more like a man is not going to be effective if women are not being valued for their confidence in the same way that men are. And that's why we see these dichotomies. Stereotyping here, but I'm sure there are many other people listening in who can identify that with the man being described as persuasive, the female being described as pushy. And if we're talking not just about equality and diversity, but also belonging and inclusion, yes, you can be appointed to that senior rank, but if you're not valued in the same way, then that undermines inclusion and belonging. And so a takeaway from that is why are these traits being so highly valued in the first place? Um, they characterise successful men, but do they actually have anything to do with your confidence and your productivity? As an economist, I was interested in that as well. Okay, so this finding of uh, this particular study that I'm sharing with you is consistent with many other studies from organisational management and psychology. What I would point out is that many of those other studies were isolated to just a single workplace or just a single industry, whereas the results I'm sharing with you talk, uh, speak about what was observed across the total workforce. And here's an, a quote from a other um, a previous study that describes how when women are uh, violating that gender norm, um, they they suffer negative implications for it. So they are less likely to be promoted. So this work is, is consistent with some of those other examples. Um, the bigger picture here is I think the argument to 
uh, steer away from these types of initiatives, apart from the individual backlash and repercussions that females can receive, is that it's, it sends a message that women are deficient. So we are undermining, we aren't valuing what women bring uh, to, to the table. And also it is a distraction. It's focusing on women and placing the onus on women to change rather than focusing on the organisation and placing the onus on organisational structures and systems to change. Uh, there is another study here uh, recently published by some economists knowing when to ask and it suggests that women are actually quite good at reading the signals of whether or not this negotiation is going to go well and if they don't negotiate for a higher wage and they're forced to, they actually found that they end up with a worse result. So there's something that uh, women, it's not completely irrational that they're not push, putting themselves forward. There's something that they're picking up on that this won't be re well received uh, in this particular workplace or this particular context. So I think we need to give a lot more weight uh, to women's behaviour actually being uh, rational. In terms of why are uh, confident people being rewarded, confident men being rewarded in the first place, um, I had to be open to the possibility that maybe if you are more confident, you are more competent. It does equate to uh, performance. So I went looking for other studies that would attest to that. Didn't find them. Instead, I found more of the opposite, that overconfidence can be a liability and set you up to be more of a, uh, a risk factor for making decisions rather than it being an asset to the organisation. And so the takeaway there is that why are employers not focusing on attributes that actually matter for productivity and performance? And why aren't they valuing the things that women tend to have more of, such as agreeableness? I would have thought that being more agreeable makes you uh, more effective as a team player, important for teamwork, collaboration, workplace dynamics. Um, and putting that aside, if you look bigger picture, what about the gains of diverse, having this diversity of personality attributes? And there's um, a whole stream of literature and, uh, and uh, work, workforce uh, evidence um, testifying to that as well. And this comes from the late, one of the latest uh, Harvard Business Reviews um, that's building, building this evidence base that actually if you are appointing someone on the basis of their confidence, you're probably not uh, appointing the right person unless you're also looking at um, other attributes that matter. So this paint, this also uh, is consistent with the uh, broader suite of research, which um, follows on nicely from the previous uh, presentation, that really trying to change people, trying to intervene at a personal level is really, really hard. We have years and years of ingrained behaviour, how we behave and how we assess others, really hard to undo, especially in a three-hour training program. So um, this is a quote from the work of Iris Bonnet, which was also mentioned earlier, um, and this book. And I think this book is really important and helpful because it, it takes a lot of the research and translates it into usable language for practitioners. And the heart of the message is that um, we can de-bias organisations. We can change the way that we write our job descriptions, the way that we assess candidates to be objective rather than based on gut instinct or subjectivity because that's getting in the way of um, equity and it's getting in the way of a, a merit-based uh, system. Um, now, I feel like sometimes when we're talking to people, um, we have to remind ourselves of how we are all biased and maybe this is something you want to do yourself or this is a technique that you can use when you're having conversations with other colleagues who say, yeah, but I'm not biased. I look at the, the references or the referee reports and, you know, I, I'm pretty objective. Um, and so I think we need to be equipped with ways to kind of shake up people's um, awareness of their own internal biases. One example here, this comes from um, work of Mickey Hebel and her colleagues, is what language, what tone do we use when we are describing uh, men and women in their professional capacity? And, and a uh, tangible 
illustration of that is when we write reference letters or referral letters for our colleagues, for our students, for our bosses. Look back at some of the ones that you have written previously or pretend you're going to sit down and write one. What would be the words or the tone that you use to describe your male colleagues compared to your female colleagues? This study found that in referral letters that were talking about women, there were far more words that we use which were kind of conditional and tentative. So they call them doubt raises. Things like, well, it's true that she doesn't have much experience, but da da da. Or she needs only minimal supervision. Or she might not be the best, but she's good. So there's a degree of qualification of conditional caveats there rather than um, a you know, he, uh, describing something in more absolute or more certain terms. Um, it's not mentioned in the quote there, but I think we could also reflect on the way that we describe um, females as being nice and likeable and a good team player and courteous. Not sure that we use th those types of words as much when we describe uh, male colleagues. We probably describe them more as ambitious and accomplished so think about it and use that when you're having a uh, conversation with other people. Finally, I'd like to wrap up by sharing with you um, some of the research. When I came across it, I thought, wow, this really helps to make sense of why often we can have the best policy in place, the best intentions, and yet people will come up with reasons not to put it into place um, and push back and resistance. There is this study based on um, Australian workers uh, that you've got the citation down there. And what they were looking for was um, uh, profiling people according to their, pers their, their value system and then also measuring their degree of supportiveness towards diversity initiatives and diversity on the basis of gender, race and disability. And they looked for patterns and correlations. What they found is that the most uh, negative attitudes, so the most, uh, the strongest lack of support for diversity initiatives was evident amongst those people who placed a high value on conservatism and self-enhancement. So conservatism is described as wanting to preserve tradition and current structures. So the, the cartoon there on the side kind of epitomizes that. This is the way we've always done it. Um, you know, I want my son to go to the same school with, you know, the same traditions that that uh, that continue on throughout time. Uh, I don't see a need to change that, to disrupt the status quo. And the second one there, self-enhancement, opportunities for my own achievement and power. So you can see there how they people who value those things might perceive diversity initiatives as being a threat to those things that they value, particularly, for instance, okay, uh, I want a merit-based system so that I can rise to the top and suddenly you want to introduce quotas that's going to threaten my opportunity um, for career progress. So when I read about these um, findings, I thought that really helps us to make sense of where that resistance can actually come from a very personal level. You might look at on paper and say, yes, we're going to have uh, potential improvements in organisational profit, etc. But where does that sit with what I value as a, at an individual level and what I want to, um, you, you know, uh, pursue and maintain in terms of the way we currently do things? Um, and I've got some examples here. I'm sure other people have other examples too. So this is from um, the survey by the American Economic Association um, asking where they have embarked on a lot of uh, excellent initiatives to promote and foster um, diversity and inclusion. Um, and these are some of the examples of the qualitative feedback that they've received. So to read out this line here, as a white male researcher, I already experienced the flip side of affirmative action when my applications for some positions don't stand a, ch don't stand a chance through no fault of my own. So that's speaking to that threat to self-enhancement. And the second slide here, uh, is uh, says uh, devoting any time or attention to diversity and inclusion is a ridiculous, politically correct waste of time. So they describe it as non-existent problems, non-existent issues. And what that is reflecting is that they don't recognise implicit biases. They don't. They don't see it as a problem. They think it's an even playing field. 
um, they don't recognise all of the subtle ways that um, people's opportunities are being suppressed. Uh, to share with you some positive outcomes, because otherwise it's too dismal, uh, what they did find was a positive correlation between people who uh, supported the, the value of universalism, so that global concern for humanity and not defining people in terms of in-groups or out-groups. So I think the more that we can foster activities that promote that, um, that actually brings to the fore um, that sense of support for diversity, which makes sense. Um, so to bring all that together and to offer some action steps, I think um, we want to always remind ourselves and acknowledge how unconscious bias exists in all of us. And I think it's helpful for us to be messengers, messengers of that as well in our own workplace um, and to appreciate how gender norms are so in deeply ingrained, um, to understand where that resistance to diversity initiatives comes from. And I don't know if we have all the answers yet to that question. I think that's really um, important to explore that further. How do you accommodate those individual values with organisational goals? How do you reassure people that you'll still have an opportunity for tradition and self-enhancement, but we can't let that get in the way of these other important organisational goals? And that final message of thinking, okay, in those different stages and targeting individuals is well intentioned, but really, really difficult and probably unfair that women have to go off to all these training, you know, mentoring sessions rather than doing our own, you know, getting ahead on our own work. But let's focus on debiasing organisational um, practices and letting the evidence um, flow from that. Um, a couple of books here. If there's anyone in the audience who hasn't read these yet, um, I would highly recommend it. That first one there, Stop Fixing Women, is by an Australian author, uh, Catherine Fox. I think together it makes a really nice package. So, you know, they're the ones you want to pop up on the, on the bookshelf um, of your office. Um, there's sharing some of the um, articles that I've written um, about this where really I'm aiming to be like, uh, many of the other uh, people involved with this conference, take the research, tr interrogate it, translate it into um, actionable words that people can relate to. Um, and that brings me to the end. So I'm um, happy to discuss further and uh, to take your questions. Uh, Leonora, that uh, was fantastic. And I I got so much we could talk for the next hour on it. I, I just want to make a, a few comments. Um, I want to just uh, maybe uh, challenge the notion that uh, changing uh, individual behavior is hard. That's a joke. That's, <laughs> that's I'm oh, totally I'm, oh, I'm happy to hear, I, I, I'm happy to hear I, your face for it. <laughs> like, is he serious? No, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And one of the things I just wanna call out, um, if we can change the environment around people, to your earlier point, it gives them permission to change. It's an easier shift. So are we consciously changing the systems and processes, including the technologies that we're using and the insight that we're generating to allow people to, to move and shift? Is that what you're um, you advocating? I assume it is, but you know, putting a fine point on it so it actually informs how we do return to workplace strategy, compensation, learning, all those formerly disparate um, functions and processes, if we can think more cohesively, then we can actually have a journey, a set of experiences that allows people to be more authentic and show their true selves and actually hold space for others to um, share their stories. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that fine point? Yes, I think you're right about if we can nurture an environment that is as free as possible of biases, then you will see individual change and behaviour arising from that. So maybe it's like we've got the order around the wrong way when yeah. we've been targeting individuals and thinking that will flow through to organisational change, perhaps. Well, well, with that in mind, like who owns that? So I talked earlier around, you know, there's cultural initiatives, there's employee engagement, there's learning, um, you know, diversity, 
equity and inclusion officers often have VP or above titles, yet they're grossly under-resourced, so they rely on their influence. And so if we actually were more serious about this, correct me if I'm wrong, this wouldn't be an ancillary initiative. It would be core to how we're developing systems and processes. Is that what you would yeah. echo and then add to that? Look, yeah, I think if there's one thing you want to change, it's process embedded in everyday practices rather than considering this to be some sort of separate body of work or mm -hmm. responsibility. An example I can give you is that notion of gender lensing and gender responsive budgeting or gender impact analysis. Ideally, what any workplace would do is put through a filter any proposed practice or policy change. And we do that in in uh, increasingly, we should be doing it in uh, economic policy. So for mm -hmm. instance, when we had the, uh, the uh, design of the fiscal stimulus, how do we get the economy rolling again? How do we prop up um, you know, industries and support workers? In Australia, the government decided we're going to support uh, the construction workforce because you know, building more houses and, and building more uh, getting, the, getting that industry, that creates jobs. Now, if you put that through a gender lens, 89% of the construction workforce is, is male. So mm -hmm. if you had taken a breather to say, hang on, is there a gendered pattern to who is affected by this policy? Then you would pause and think, okay, what's something that we can redesign that would be more equitable? Another example I would give in terms of uh, transition out of COVID and moving back to the workforce, I think there will be a, a great uptake of working from home arrangements, even mm -hmm. if it's safe enough to go back uh, to the workforce, um, or it might be, you know, some days at home, some days back there. Now, mm -hmm. for a lot of women and a lot of uh, gender equality advocates, they're saying this is fantastic for women because we can, do, and, and for working parents and for any workers who have caring responsibilities, It'll give us more flexibility to maintain our attachment to the workforce as well as um, look after our caring responsibilities at home. It will save on commuting time, etc. So I think we're focused on all these gains. Now think about it. When we go back to the workforce, how are, work, how are employers going to make decisions about who gets that project, who gets promoted? We know that a huge implicit bias comes in with face-to-face -face interaction. Who have you had the, the conversations with in the corridor? And so you're, you're actually setting up a system which is going to have implicit biases in it if you yep. don't really interrogate who, who's going for a promotion, who, who are these job appointees? Are we giving everyone equal opportunity to put, their, um, put themselves forward for that promotion in an objective way because we know those implicit biases are there. So that's another example if we go ahead with working from home, put that through a gender lens first to yeah. consider are there going to be inadvertent fallouts from that type yeah. of policy? So I would call it gender lensing. Any decision that's made, it's like you do an environmental impact analysis. What is the fallout before we go ahead with it? That's, that's yeah. a lot of work and a lot more resourcing and requires more consultation. It, yeah, and, and to your point, it takes more work. It takes more creativity. It makes sitting with it and exploring scenarios absolutely. I mean, I just want to celebrate your systematic uh, thinking and approach so, you know, so much. I've been criticized and received pushback over the years. Al, you're trying to boil the ocean. It's too much. We can only do this sliver. But it's like, you know, I'm not trying to boil the ocean. I'm just trying to launch a boat that won't sink. And so we have to think about, you know, the gaps in the boat and fill those so we can actually have something that actually has integrity as we move forward in time. So I, I love what you're, you're sharing. I'm going to... Um, to quote you, and I just want to call it out because I think it's really, really important. You said, quote, sampling on the dependent variable. Now, as someone with an economics background as well, I get I, in predictive analytics and you know, people in the people analytics space, well, we want to get to predictive, we want to get prescriptive. I go like this <laughs> because that perpetuates the history because it's based on historical data and it 
oftentimes it doesn't allow for disruption. And so can you just, as we start to close here, I, you know, maybe offer a coaching tip or two on how we should be thinking about using data, whether it be our own organization's data or consuming external data on this topic, not only of gender diversity, but of diversity in general. Sure, yes. Yeah. So data is inc incredibly powerful when used right. <laughs> so to begin with, ideally you want broad data that's representative of your sample so that you are not inadvertently uh, picking up or to make sure that you're getting the right uh, causality and, and not correlation. So you want to make sure you've got robust data that you're pinpointing a is causing B rather than we just happen to observe it because we've got this narrow sample and we don't yeah. actually have a proper counterfactual. Maybe that's the way I should describe it. Have you got a proper counterfactual in there to describe the people who weren't exposed to this initiative or this intervention to see yeah. if we can pinpoint the actual uh, um, impact of that intervention? With data, what I would also increasingly point out is that there is it's very unlikely that one solution fix, fixes all. So we have intersectionality, we have different um, cohorts of the workforce, different demographic groups. It's very likely that what works for one industry, what works for one group of people, what works for one occupational tier doesn't necessarily work for others. And it's quick, really quick example there. Thank is you that, for saying that. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. have, if you have um, men, I think there's a lot of men now who've experienced work, uh, working from home, they want to spend more time with their families. So what we're really interested in is um, paid parental leave or uh, paternity leave for, for fathers. Now, what we might see, two hypotheses here, right? One could be that uh, men ask for it and they're seen favorably in their workforce. Yes, this is great. You're showing that you are interested in, in your family, that you're holistic, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're caring. Or it could be, oh, you're not serious about your work anymore. And my hypothesis there was that that's going to depend on the um, man's uh, level of seniority in the organization. Have they proven themselves? or are they still working their way up the career ladder? So that's an example of how, when we look at data, do you have different groups represented? Otherwise yeah. you're gonna get an um, incorrect conclusion. Yeah, and to your point, a lot of those groups aren't uh, self-evident. Like we have to find out if they have two kids at home, if they you know, have elderly parents that they're taking care of, and what other constraints that they have on their capacity and and uh, you know ability to contribute. So I mean, we, obviously, we can talk uh, you know much more on this. How can uh, listeners and viewers learn more about you and what you're doing? Oh, thanks. Uh, I think on the screen there, uh, there's my website. So I'm. I'm very happy to share what I can to this community. Like I said, it's based on what does the research say. Um, I'm really keen to hear what others are doing because I think part of my broader mission is not just what I'm doing, but how do we bring it together? How do we learn from each other, get all these case studies like a meta-analysis so that we can communicate that to organisations in a systematic way? So please reach out to me if there's things you'd like to share. Well, uh, Leonora, I, I love what you're contributing to this uh, very, very important discussion. Uh, yeah, and thank you for sharing with me. Thank you for sharing with our community. And I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, in the coming you know, weeks and months. Uh, you know, I know we're not going to be done for a long, long time on this topic. So yeah, again, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Al. Thank you. All right.